Thank you, Donald, and good evening, everybody. Well, last night, as we were live on the programme, we saw by 309 votes to 305, the government got defeated. Mrs May's first big Commons defeat on the Brexit withdrawal bill, and kind of my guess is, once you lose one, you start to lose a few more. And this hasn't even got yet to the House of Lords, which is stuffed full of career placemen and women who are all part of the establishment. And the response to it today, very interesting. Following on, and it's been a bit of a tradition, really, since the uh, referendum, uh, we had uh, the Daily Mail some time ago with the judges, enemies of the people. We had the Telegraph a few weeks ago, the Brexit mutineers, and not to be outdone today, the Daily Mail published the photographs of 11 Tory MPs with the headline, Proud of Yourselves. And as they say, just as the newly confident Tories inch ahead in the polls, 11 self-consumed malcontents pull the rug from under our EU negotiators, betray their leader, their party, and 17.4 million Brexit voters, and, most damning of all, increase the possibility of a Marxist in number 10. I'm asking you tonight, do you think... This is fair comment from the Daily Mail, or is it over-the-top journalism? And if you think, actually, do you know what? The Mail have just about got this bang on the money. Then call me on 0345 6060 973. Or if you think, actually, this is totally unfair, these people, like Ken Clark, who've been in Parliament since 1970, have held this view right throughout their careers. So actually, all they were doing was following their conscience, and it's unfair to berate them in this way, then text me on 84850. Or perhaps you think, really, far from being about principle and parliamentary sovereignty, this is in fact a remain a backlash, an attempt to stop Brexit from happening, in which case, using the hashtag Farage and LBC, tweet at LBC, and you can watch me on Facebook from here in the London studio, and you can comment there too. Now, as we speak, Mrs May is in Brussels. There's a, yet another European summit taking place. I'm very pleased to say I'm not there. Um, I'm Strasbourg out after this week, but... LBC's political editor, Theo Usherwood, is there, and he's picking up the latest gossip and news. And I'm wondering, Theo, last Friday, Mrs May returned from Brussels. She was a a heroine. Um, Virtually everybody apart from me said how wonderfully uh, everything was going. Is that the buzz tonight? No. Right. There's a feeling... (laughs) (laughs) There's a feeling here, Nigel... The Prime Minister is about to be ripped off. You've heard her insistence, haven't you? It's been well documented that if we pay the divorce bill, if we accept the terms of Northern Ireland, if we take into account the European Court of Justice, then we will get that all-important trade deal and that she'll move to phase two and that we will have made sufficient progress. But what's emerging here in Brussels tonight is that the European Commission has successfully split the divorce settlement, all of those things I've just talked about, and the trade deal that what was agreed with Jean-Claude Juncker last Friday under the terms of Article 50 will have no bearing on the fact that uh, Mrs May wants a trade deal. Now, Mr Juncker's chief negotiator is Michel Barnier, and he's made it very clear that the EU can only negotiate trade deals with third-party countries. And that's done under an entirely separate rule. That's Article 218. And the fear is that by splitting the two, Mrs May isn't going to get her negotiated, she isn't going to get her trade deal, the one thing that she wants above everything else. And that's a real problem for her. And this is why, Theo, isn't it? And I was there yesterday in the chamber in Strasbourg when Mr Verhofstadt, the Parliament's chief negotiator, said that he basically ordered David Davis on the telephone that we had to put into law everything we offered last Friday before we can move on to the next stage. So basically... We closed down Article 50 in guarantee for absolutely diddly squat in return, and we then move on to the Article 218 process. Would that be about right? Bang on the money, Nigel. And the thing is that Mr Verhofstadt is insisting that he wants it to be legally binding because David Davis 
implied, didn't he, at the weekend that uh, it would only be a state. What was agreed last Friday with Jean Claude Juncker was only a statement of intent. That yes. Somehow there might be some movement on EU citizens' rights, and that's why yes. Mr. Verhofstadt has come out lauding it, saying, "No, no, no, no. We must make this a legally binding document." In actual fact, you're quite right to say the fear is that by signing us up to Article 50, he's in effect putting pressure on us to do so and making it a legally binding document, and then we bounce into a completely separate negotiation, uh, negotiation on the trade deal, which is under Article 218, which has no bearing whatsoever. We can't turn around and say, well, we agreed, what we agreed with the divorce bill was that we'd get a trade deal, because the two things are completely separate. Now, I've been, sp now, I've been speaking to Mr. Verhofstadt yep. today. You, you mentioned the Daily Mail, you mentioned the front page that they ran, and of course those Tory Brexit rebels. From his point of view, he's pleased as punch. I think that the most easy part has been done. And now we come to the more difficult part, and that will be um, from March on, a discussion on the, on the future relationship. Uh, and on the withdrawal agreement, there is still, in our opinion, one outstanding issue uh, that needs to be solved, that is that there comes a procedure for the citizens' rights that is easy, cost-free, one form per family, with the burden of proof on the back of the Home Office and not of the citizens, and that has still to be put uh, in the withdrawal agreement. So that's difficult, and then yeah, the whole discussion about the future relationship. Are you negotiating with the British Parliament or with Theresa May, sir? No, we, uh, our role is to give uh, the green light, uh, the approval at the end of the whole process. And that's exactly also what the uh, British Parliament will do now but, but after the vote of yesterday. You must have liked the result yesterday, hey? I did a tweet about it, yeah. You liked it? You must have smiled. I, I think I, I am, I am a parliamentarian. I defend uh, parliamentary democracy. And I think uh, we can uh, only be uh, positive about it. I'm always, I, I see Great Britain as, uh, yeah, as, as the basis, as the source of parliamentary democracy, and that has been uh, proved again yesterday. So Mr Verhofstadt talks about parliamentary democracy, and he's a believer in it, when Theo, whether you like it or don't like it, the whole objective of the European Union has been to take away national parliamentary sovereignty and to transfer it up to a higher level. I can scarcely believe the words these people are uttering. When I, uh, when I thought about playing uh, that little interview, that oh, section of that interview, dear. Nigel, I did think about your oh, blood pressure. Oh, I dear. thought you might need to go and have a drink. I, I, well, I, some, I said I may have to pop out and get me something, I think. I mean, it's just ridiculous. I mean, I, you know, look, it may well be that it's a great idea to transfer decision-making power up to European Commission and European Parliament levels. But for goodness sake, don't pretend that anything that happened last night in Westminster, that anything these 11 did, was to do with parliamentary democracy. These are the same people who've worked with Mr Verhofstadt to give away the power of Parliament. That aside, Theo, and I'm calming down now, <laughs> um, do you get the impression that the British government when they came back on Friday to this uh, really huge level of congratulation, apart from me, you know, I was considered to be, you know, the old Mizog sitting in the corner of the bar. Um, mm. Do you think they understood that once Article 50 was closed, there'd be a whole new procedure about to be opened? I think there is a, a high level of pretense going on. You know, I was in a briefing with uh, a number 10 spokesman, prime minister's official spokesman, and there was, you know, an insistence from their part that, you know, the two, Article 50 and Article 218 were linked. And there's a referral, of course, to paragraph 96, the last paragraph of that agreement yeah. um, on Friday, which uh, attempts to say that we will only sign up to this particular, uh, you know, Northern Ireland divorce bill and EU citizens' rights if we get the trade deal. Uh, and they're relying on that. But from our understanding, actually, the existing EU legislation actually supplants that and overrides it. And Mrs May, whether, you know, there's been a huge amount of debate about how important last night's vote was, but it certainly, it, it's taken the wind out of her sails. And when she arrived, she was very, very shaky. 
I'm disappointed with the amendment, but uh, actually the EU withdrawal bill is making good progress through the House of Commons, and we're on course to deliver on Brexit. And if, remember last week, President Juncker uh, said that sufficient progress had been made to move on to phase two of our negotiations. Yesterday, the European Parliament overwhelmingly voted to accept that recommendation too, and I'm looking forward to discussing that deep and special partnership for the future. Mrs May will address the working dinner tonight, Nigel, on the transitional arrangements. She then gets on a plane and flies back to London, and then tomorrow it's just down to the EU mm. 27. Well, there is a question, Theo, I can tell you, uh, that my lawyers in Brussels have been raising with me for some time, and it's this, that not only is the trade deal going to come under Article 218, but perhaps even the transition deal comes under a whole new section also and as that lovely mr verhofstadt made clear they're not even going to start talking about us until march despite giving us this deadline there's going to be no substantive conversation about this starting until march and it looks to me like the british prime minister last friday was done up like a kipper yes and you're quite right to pick up on that timetabling uh, factor because theresa may had hoped to start trade talks this Friday. <laughs> Some uh, that was the whole point. That was the whole point of scheduling that meeting with uh, Mr. Juncker, which was blown apart by the DUP on the Monday and then had to bounce on to the Friday. Uh, and now there's just going to be some cursory discussions about the transitional arrangements. And then there's going to be another three months, which will allow the European Council to set out its negotiating positions on the on uh, the trade deal. And then, of course, because of last night's vote, Mrs. May may well have to bring forward uh, the deadline for the conclusions of the trade talks, which would, in effect, allow Britain potentially only four or five months to do a really complex trade deal. This, Nigel, does mm. heighten the possibility of a no-deal Brexit, because lurking in the wings will be people like Jacob Rees-Mogg, will be people like Boris Johnson, saying if we're not going to get a good deal and we're going to pay all this money at the same time, what's the point? Why don't we just revert to a clean Brexit on World Trade Organisation? Yeah, rules? well, there'll be some of them. There'll be some of them. Theo, thank you. Have a great evening there in Brussels. Well, Theo, they're bringing us up to speed with the latest news, which is that once Article 50 is concluded, and we thought it was, Verhofstadt wants and, and Barnier want a little bit more, but once it's concluded, that actually doesn't guarantee us the thing. We move on to a whole new procedure, Article 218. And here's the real kicker, that for a new trade deal, to be agreed under Article 218, this will not happen under a majority vote. It will need unanimity. And one country, maybe one the size of Luxembourg, which is slightly bigger than Croydon, but not much, could veto the whole shooting match. And I begin to ask myself, are we perhaps wasting not just months, but years of our life pursuing something that isn't attainable. But back to, back to, that was the latest news from Brussels, back to the original question for debate tonight. The Daily Mail publish on their front page 11 Conservative members of Parliament under a headline, proud of yourselves, and they say they are self-consumed malcontents, pulling the rug from under our EU negotiators, betraying their leader and betraying 17.4 million Brexit voters. Is that a fair, reasonable headline and summation, or is it completely over the top? You're listening to The Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC. It's 7.16. Well, you've had the live expert analysis from the European Summit in Brussels, but because this is LBC, you don't hear from commentators, politicians and experts endlessly, because this show, this station, is about you and what you think. So back to my basic question. Are the Daily Mail, were they right to put these 11 faces on the front page and to say that they betrayed their leader and the nation. Was it fair comment, or was it over the top? And I got a new caller from Hendon, John, who's going to answer that question for me. Good evening. No, the Daily Mail was wrong. Good evening, guys. I want to speak to you, Nigel. Good evening. Yeah. They were wrong. Why were they wrong, John? Well, basically, these guys have put their own job uh, at risk uh, they're, they're against their own party, uh, against their own leader, and obviously they're looking out for the interests of... Because we talked about doing the... During the election time, we talked about parliament democracy, yeah? And I also voted for Brexit, mm -hmm. yeah? But I, I voted for him to control the immigration, yeah? So now we were told again and again, we could have a, yourself said in many occasions, no, we could have a Norway plus model, yeah? Yes. Now, now, what's happened to it now? Now it looks like we're in a right mess. 
Well, I don't know what tourism is doing. I don't know what's going on. Well, John, John, could it yeah. be? Could it be one of the reasons we're in a mess, and one of the reasons Theresa May is not making the progress that she should, is because of these eleven people who were stopping her. Well, it's not the eleven people because we talked about democracy in our parliament. Well, we don't have a democracy in the parliament. We have dictators like North Korea. Do you think it's as bad as that? So I, I, yes, well, it could get bad as that. Look at the situation we are on. I voted myself against Brexit. But look, look at it now. I, I feel I regret it because this is all things in a mess. All right? But it's in a and mess. We were told we, we could have a trade deal. We could well, have a well, John, deal John, John, we can do all these things with the right leadership. But maybe it's difficult. For our, and I'm, I'm for once trying to be nice about Theresa May. It's really hard for me, but um, you know, maybe the reason she can't do the things she wants to do and the things she set out in her Lancaster House speech is she's not getting the support from her own party. And John, I want to say this to you: these people, these people who voted last night against the government, were all elected just a few months ago on a Conservative manifesto. Is it right? within a few months of being elected, on a Brexit means Brexit manifesto, to effectively go against it. Yeah, but Brexit's not made at any cost, uh, Nigel. Sure. Brexit obviously has to be the right, you know, we have to protect our job, we have to protect our companies, you know, we've got to look at the interests of the country. And we keep going on about 17.2 million. It, it, not everyone who voted for the same reason. If there was a vote tomorrow, I'll vote again for a Brexit. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. the way we are, we are now, we're in the right mess. You want uh, to agree to that? I, I, John, I could not disagree with that in any way at all. It's a complete horlix. But your basic view, despite being a Brexiteer, is that these people have a right to express their conscience, yeah? Of course they have. Otherwise, yep. we have a dictatorship like yep. that. No, no, John, John, you've made that point clearly and beautifully, and you've made it as a Brexiteer, which makes it even more valuable. And I thank you very much indeed for your comment and for your call. Guy is calling from Leicester, another new caller of the show. Good evening, Guy. Good evening. Good evening. So, have the mail got it right, or is it over the top? Uh, I believe the mail's got it over, over the top. We have it, but at the same time, we have a free press. Uh -huh. And the mail can do what they see fit. You know, it's it's one of the things. Yeah, I mean, there's almost a competition now, Guy, isn't there, between the Telegraph and the mail, who can name and shame, uh, you know, Tory MPs who were not supporting the Brexit process. Well, I'm on the Telegraph, so maybe that says a bit more about me. <laughs> right. So, well, maybe, I mean, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, no, OK, no, no. So, so you think this is possibly over-the-top journalism, yeah? Over top journalism. My my personal belief is, we, we have a parliamentary democracy yep. where our parliament is meant to represent the views of the constituencies. So, as the majority of the constituencies in uh, the United Kingdom, not all, of course, uh, voted to leave the United Kingdom. Uh, European the Union. Part, European Union. Yeah, yeah, yeah. European Union. You know what I mean? Uh, then. I do, that but is, I do, but best get it right. <laughs> that, that, that's what should be happening, and that's including Labour and well, a lot of Labour seats. Well, I, I voted Leave, guy. I'm really pleased you've brought this dimension in because I haven't got a problem really with the Daily Mail publishing that. Um, I would kind of give Ken Clark a buy given that he's been a pro-EU supporter since 1970. Some of the others, I would say, you know, they were elected on a Tory manifesto and they, they perhaps could have behaved better. But I don't mind people expressing their consciences. And I think, you know, as our previous caller said, it would be a sort of dictatorship, not a parliamentary democracy, if we did that. But, Guy, you have raised the key point here, and it's the Labour Party. Because the Labour Party, back in June, stood on a manifesto, one that I praise Guy on this programme, that said the Labour Party supported leaving the European Union, leaving the single market, ending the freedom of movement of people, and four or five million people voted Labour who'd been Brexit voters the year before, and they have been completely betrayed, not by individuals voting on conscience, but completely by their party. Agreed. Totally agreed. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it's just, yeah. So I think, Guy, I think, the male, I mean, you know, look, it's fine. 
we have a free press, as you said yourself. The papers can say and do what they want. But actually, the focus shouldn't be on Ken Clark and his mates. The focus should be on Corbyn and the complete hijacking of his leadership by a Blairite parliamentary Labour Party. That's my view. Or momentum, as the ones like to call it. Well, momentum are, yes, I mean, momentum are um, very much um, in the driving seat currently in Labour, um, and they appear uh, to have a very, very pro-EU faction too. Guy, I thank you very much indeed for your call. Hi, Nigel. Article 218. Who knew? Sounds like a total scam. What on earth are we playing at? This is Alice in Wonderland stuff. Time to wake up and walk away, says Graham. Graham, I've known about 218 for some time. Um, I, my, my lawyer in Brussels has been imploring me uh, to tell you about it on this show. Uh, but frankly, it was premature. Uh, now is the right time to talk about it. But I'll, I'll make one prediction, Graham. Within a few months, virtually everybody in this country, in every pub in the land, will be an expert on Article 218, just as during the Olympics, when we have someone doing well in the diving, they all talk about that with the most amazing knowledge. Forget Article 50, it's history, it's gone, it's 218 that we're all going to be talking about. Nigel, the rebels were the only ones with backbone. I congratulated my MP, um, says Jeff, um, fine, Jeff, um, fine. No, look, if people vote with their conscience, I understand it, but... But, surely, if you're going to be elected for a party that says Brexit means Brexit, unless you've put in your election literature out to the people in your constituency that you will defy the party line on this, if you haven't done that, then frankly, Jeff, I think you've behaved very badly. As I say, Ken Clark gets a bye as far as I'm concerned. But it is Labour I want to talk about, and I was amazed at the weekend to hear Sir Keir Starmer on the Mar programme saying, what we now want is a Norway-style deal. Well, in many ways, Sir Keir, that was a very appropriate example to choose. Because twice... In the last few decades, the Norwegians have voted against membership of the European Union, only to be betrayed by their own politicians in Oslo, who signed them up for membership of the single market. And now there's a campaign in Norway to leave that single market, and that's exactly what Labour now want to do to us. So those who think I'm upset with the Tory party, no, I'm even angrier with what Labour have done. Amber is calling from Cheltenham, another new caller to the show. Amber, are the Daily Mail right, or is it just too much? I'm kind of in the middle ground. I, I do feel that people like Anna Sabri and Nicky Morgan, I've kind of been calling them traitors myself right. <laughs> uh, for a long time, actually. <laughs> Ken Clark, I appreciate what you say about Ken, because yeah. we all know what Ken's like, yeah. and he's been the same. It's like stamped through him like a stick of rock. But... What I find really distasteful is people like Anna Sabri saying that she's upholding parliamentary democracy. I know, what a joke. Well, actually, she's defying the democratic will of the people. And we, we were told that this was a vote and the vote would be upheld. Whatever yep. the people voted yep. would be what resulted that was the promise. for the country. Yep. And what we're finding is that we've got a complete mess going on, and I think it's a total and utter waste of time continuing with this negotiation. We should just pull straight out. And I think if you look at the EU, it's a dying entity. The economies across Europe are crashing. And if we go through this whole process for years more, we could end up being called upon to bail out another failing southern European country. Well, we may. We may not, but we may. But, Amber, your basic point, we were promised the, that the result would be respected, and Anna Soubry is doing her best to do everything to stop that, claiming parliamentary sovereignty when for her whole career she's tried to give away the parliamentary sovereignty of Westminster and hand it to the EU. Amber... Love the call. Great passion. You're listening to The Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC. It's now 7.30. Are the Daily Mail right? Did these 11 Tory MPs betray their leader, their party manifesto, the Brexit voters, or is it absolutely fair dues that they should express their own individual conscience on 
this issue. Uh, Jeff says, The Daily Fail is great. I wouldn't use any other newspaper to lie my rabbit arch with its exorbency of seconds and none. Meldrew says, Conservative, Labour, Liberal are all the same. The establishment want to stay in. Full stop. There is nothing we can do. I wouldn't be so sure about that. I think there are things we can do. What about the 29 million who did not vote for Brexit, I'm asked? Well, you know, you could argue that with any election. Elections are about who turns out and votes for the side that wins. And 17.4 million people was the biggest exercise of democracy ever seen in this country. And still, much debate about EU citizens living in this country. Do we have the... Because the argument's been, oh, if they're here for three months and they haven't got a job, we could actually get rid of them. I've heard that argument made by broadcasters on this channel as a means by which we could deal with EU immigration. I'm not so sure, because Home Office policy of removing EU citizens found sleeping rough on UK streets has been today declared unlawful by the High Court, and apparently it's going to have to stop. Uh, the government said it was disappointed by the ruling, uh, but there we are. So if there are people who are sleeping rough on our streets, who are not working, um, and not contributing in any way at all, we are not allowed to send them back to the country within the European Union that they come from. And yet... I hear these people saying, oh, well, of course, we don't need to leave the European Union. We're allowed to deport people if they haven't got a job after three months. Baloney. Back to the Daily Mail. Did they get it right? Did they get it wrong? Andrew from Sheffield is going to answer that for me. Good evening. Uh, I think uh, they got it about right, except I think they'd need to print a special edition to uh, name all the traitors in Parliament who are uh, trying to sell us out to Europe. Uh, after that vote last night, when I heard all the cheers going, oh, up, I was wasn't it amazing? Disgusted. Wasn't it amazing? Yeah, I was disgusted by him. No, but Andrew, Andrew, I... Andrew, just just one second. Uh, you just used the word a few moments ago, traitors. That's yeah. a very, very strong word, isn't it? Well, I see a traitor as somebody trying to sell us out to a foreign power, and I think exactly uh, that is what. Uh, a lot of these Remainers are doing. And if likes of Ken Clark and Sulbury had any conscience, they wouldn't have stood on uh, the 2017 election manifesto, which promised us Brexit. Yes. Yes, it, no, it did. It did. Andrew, I have, I, I do have sympathy with that. You know, why would you stand for a party that says something that you're diametrically opposed to? And certainly, if your own literature in your constituency didn't reflect your view, then you've been elected on a false promise. But Andrew, I, you know, my feeling on this is whether we think it's right for the male to use this headline or not, I think the male, in some ways, are firing their bullets at the wrong target. Because to me, Andrew, it's the Labour Party. Not just a few, not just 11 people who've rebelled. The Labour Party, even the Labour leavers, with the exception of two of them, Frank Field and Kate Huey, all of them in the Labour Party, have stabbed in the back loads of people in Sheffield, where you're from, who voted Brexit and then voted for Corbyn on a manifesto that said they'd leave the single market and take back border controls. Isn't it, Andrew, Labour we should be really angry with? Yeah, well, uh, I agree. Um, I think uh, that vote last night was designed to scupper Brexit. Uh, I hear Dominic Greaves saying it's a tidying up uh, Amendment, and then this morning uh, Andrew Adonis uh, puts oh. a tweet out which let the cat out of the bag, saying this is the first stage in stopping Brexit. He did, didn't he? He yeah. did. He did. Yeah. He did. That was exactly what Adonis said. And I tell you something, Andrew. If you're annoyed with what the House of Commons did last night, well, you better strap yourself into a chair when this debate gets to the House of Lords. Because that place, Andrew, is stuffed full. Hundreds of them. Put in there by Blair, put in there by Cameron, place men and place women, nearly all of whom live within the M inside the M25 and are part of the establishment elite. Well, they certainly don't have the well-being of the people of this country at all. I think they're just following uh, the globalist master's uh, orders, most of them. Or they've got something lined up. Andrew, let me ask you something, because you know you, you are clearly 
very passionate on this. And I've been saying for over a year that I did not think that if Brexit was betrayed, that ordinary people would put up with it. Do you agree with that? Uh, I think uh, people like myself won't. I mean, I'd always be willing to uh, go out on any demonstration uh, showing me displeasure with it. Uh, but I think a lot of people are apathetic. They couldn't care less as long as they've got their EastEnders and their uh, X Factor on TV. Uh, and LBC, Andrew, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I think I think uh, uh, we've got too much apathy in this country with uh, a, a hell of a lot of people, uh, and that's what well. I that may be... well be true, Andrew. But I get a sense of those that are politically engaged. It may be very difficult for the Labour Party and the Tory Party at the next election to say to them, "Come and vote for us. Trust us." Because I think this breach of trust over Brexit, if it continues the way that it is, is pretty damn serious. Andrew, I thank you very much indeed for your call. Brian is calling me from Stockton. Good evening, Brian. Uh, good evening, Nigel. Good to talk to you. Good to talk to you. New caller to the show. Uh, what do you think? Well, they're eleven hypocrites, aren't they? As you said, just <laughs> eleven hypocrites. You know, they're on about democracy in Parliament. Oh, yeah. And the vote and that. And, and as they know, unelected, they love unelected EU leaders. Where, where's the democracy there? Uh, bro, this is what gets me. This is what gets me. These same people claiming parliamentary democracy, in the case of Ken Clark, have spent their entire careers trying to get rid of national parliamentary democracy and transferring it to the European level. It's a bit rich, isn't it? It is. And you're right about the Labour as well, Nigel. I yeah. mean, I'm from Stockton. Yep. We voted out in the referendum yep. to be out. And Labour, all, our Labour, they're selling all us down the river, saying they want to stay in the EU, you know, the single market, the yep. customs union. Not bothered about... I mean, I voted leave for the same as you. I thought the big thing about get control back of the borders. Yes. The main thing. Yeah, and well, that... That's went by... Well, that was the main thing, Brian, wasn't it? That was... You know, I mean, obviously, leaving was about taking back control of our country, but borders were the key issue, weren't they? Yes, and, and, and that's just gone out the window, hasn't it? Eight years more of the, well, the, the justice. Well, it's a joke. You Brian? Know, as you say, that can bring the families and that. Oh, yeah. You know, oh, yeah, family reunions. Eight. Yes, 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 yeah. But do you know what, Brian? I'm beginning to think, and I, I don't want to say this, but I'm beginning to think... We may have to fight them again. Well, the Leavers, there's got to be a storm over this, hasn't there, Nigel? We've got to start fighting back. We've got to start fighting back, Brian. And you're in the mood to, aren't you? I am, definitely. You know, because this is all wrong, isn't it? We it, had the vote. Yep. They can't accept it. Yep. They're a bad you know, lot, Brian. They're a bad lot. I've got you on the list. The first the first march I organise, Brian, you'll be in the front line with me. Jamie on Facebook says, The Daily Mail has the right to publish this story on the front page. Obviously, the Mail doesn't like these 11 MPs, but in a free democratic Britain, these 11 MPs have the right to vote for what they want to. Jamie, I agree with you. You know, I do think MPs have the right to vote with their conscience. Although Sarah Wollaston was telling us in the first half of the referendum campaign, that she was a lever. And I haven't seen Sarah Wollaston's election address that was put out to the public in June this year. I'm very keen to get a copy. Anyone listening has got a copy, please send it in to me. Because, sure, you can express a conscience, but if you're elected on a party ticket that says you will support the Prime Minister's efforts to get Brexit, and then you go against it, strikes me there is something ever so slightly wrong with that. But, you know, please, if you think I'm wrong, call me on 0345 6060 973. You're listening to The Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC. It's 7.45. The Daily Mail front page naming and shaming the 11 Tories who voted against the government because they want to have a final say on whatever the Brexit deal is. Proud of yourself, says the Mail, and says they betrayed their leader, their party manifesto and 17.4 million people. I'm asking you whether that's right or not, and I'm getting a lot of passion back in response on both sides of the argument. I wonder what Shabazz in Manchester makes of all of this. Good evening. Good evening, Nigel. When are you coming back to politics? Uh, well, um, when I'm Brexit needed, is, Shabazz. When I'm needed, Shabazz, you know. Um, you are needed. Come back to politics because Brexit is not going to happen. 
Because I'll tell you what, we voted for taking control, finance and laws and border. Yes. We voted, that's what we voted for. Yes. We're not going to get it because one, the Prime Minister does not have a majority. Second, Labour, a bunch, bunch of liars, betrayed us and the British people are saying that they, voted, they, are, they upheld the Brexit vote but they don't. And the third of all, the most unelected corrupt department is the Lords. I'm really... Do you know what, Shabazz? I, 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 I shudder to think when we get to Tony Blair and David Cameron's mates, hundreds of them who were appointed to the Lords, what we're going to hear. So, yeah, I'm worried too. Well, Shabazz, all I can say is I think we are headed in the wrong direction. It's not over yet. There is one hope, Shabazz, and Peter Bone was on this show on Sunday, entertaining as ever. And, and Bone made the point that actually we're probably headed to a point where the whole thing's going to collapse because the EU were being so perfectly unreasonable, and we could, Shabazz, crash out with no deal. And that would be a damn sight better, would it not, than where we are now? Too right. It would be a lot better, because at the end of the day, we're Great Britain. Yeah. We're not a small island. Now, we're Great Britain. Now, we can rule our own country better than, they, uh, than Europeans and Parliament. So do a march, and I'll be with you side by side. Right. Do a march. We want our Brexit. We, what we want to vote. We, we want, want our Brexit. And all I would say, Shabazz, to anybody who wants to march, whether it's for Brexit or against Brexit, is that is absolutely a fair, good expression and thing to do in a democracy, provided we're peaceful and civil when we do it, Shabazz, yeah? Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. But the, the MPs do not represent us at all. No. Because people who voted for Brexit are not representing Parliament, because all of them, like you said, are living in the M25. They don't represent the North, uh, the North East, uh, Wales, none of them do. Uh, Shabazz, I, 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 my job here is to pick holes in your argument. I can't, because you're absolutely dead, blooming right. A new caller, Shabazz to the show, call again, thank you. Again, huge passion on both sides of this argument. I wonder what Anne from Ludlow makes of all of this. Good evening, Anne. Good evening, Mr. Farage. How lovely to be able to talk to you. Well, thank you. So, are, are, these, have, uh, are, are these 11 people, Anne, are they, are they traitors or are they just people expressing their conscience? They are under the guise of expressing their conscience because it suits them. Mm -hmm. They're actually traitors. Oh, gosh. They ha are... Strong language. Str strong language, Anne. I mean, apart from who I call Mr. Blue Suede Shoes, yeah. as we all know, well, Ken. you know, he's going with his principles. I yes. can see that. Yes. Died in the wool. But the rest of them, and, and others we, I don't know, around, um, they are hell-bent on stopping this Brexit, the exit of Britain from the European Union. Yes. And I am appalled by them because, look, sending off their prime minister the night before she goes to do more deals, she, you know, it's disgraceful. Yeah, I mean, actually, Theresa May, Anne, was, I, I felt that what happened last Friday with the Prime Minister leaving Downing Street at 3.45 in the morning to go and meet three unelected old men in Brussels to beg for a deal, I thought that was humiliating. Imagine, Anne and take the politics out of it, but imagine how the British Prime Minister felt turning up this afternoon at the European summit, having lost a vote in the House of Commons last night because some of her own side went against her. Exactly. Absolutely right. I didn't need the Daily Mail to tell me what they were... Well, what was on the front page. I didn't read it. But um, they're helping the Labour Party. Yep. They're doing everything. Do you know, I thought back the other day what this is like. Do you remember that programme years ago called The Prisoner? Yes. Where, where the poor man is, thinks he's escaped, he's finally getting somewhere, yep. suddenly the big white balloon comes and gets him. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And I'm really worried because and I'm, I voted no ECJ, no uh, um single market, and yep. uh, no um, customs. No. So and ruling our borders. That's what we want. That's what masses of people I know around here, uh, and all my family, friends, 
I mean, this is what we want. We want our country back. So, do, do you and think, Anne? Idiots, we can rule our own selves. Well, but I've always that. believed. I've always believed that, and I've always been astonished, actually, by the lack of self-belief so many in Westminster have about our ability as a nation to chart our own course on the world's stormy oceans. And I would, I would agree with that. But Anne, you know, seems to me that if Brexit does get betrayed on all sides, that fundamental breakdown of trust in our democratic process is pretty serious, isn't it? This is what infuriates me. And as you pointed out earlier, they came uh, on a manifesto to do this, and these people are, are going against it. And that Anna Soubry, yeah. she annoys me beyond belief, because all she comes in with her fork, Tongue. Yeah. Oh, yes, of course I believe. Yes, and I respect it. All these, they, they come in with those first words. Yes. But then we get all the reality. Oh, yeah. She oh, was, let's stay in the same oh, let's She was in the election, time. Anne. In the election, Anne. She was, vote for me. I will support Theresa May and get a good Brexit deal. Anne, I thank you very much indeed for your call and for your uh, passion, because there's lots of it. I don't know if they were right or wrong, but it was something predictable. This is what you get with May and her party. Corbyn never said he wants to reverse Brexit. Uh, just not your kind of Brexit, Nigel. Well, Corbyn is very careful to say nothing about Brexit, but Keir Starmer was out there, Andre, on Twitter, he was out there on Sunday saying he wanted a Norway-style deal, which would keep us trapped inside single market rules. The point of Brexit is not to have European laws. It's to make our own laws. And you know what, Andre? We might make brilliant laws. We might make dreadful laws. But the people that make those laws will be accountable to us, and we can remove them at every single election. Nigel, where was the screw of these rebel MPs of 40 years of EU laws and diktats, says Barry. Don't know, matey. Didn't notice any of that myself. Um, let's go to another caller. Let's go to Jim in Nottingham. Jim, good evening. Good evening to you, Nigel. Thank so, you. Nice to talk to you. Well, thank you I'm for coming on. I'm absolutely seething with the Labour Party, to be honest. I'm a Conservative voter. Yes. But I know that the Labour Party pinched loads and loads of UKIP votes in the north of England. They did. On the promise yep, that yep, they would yep, stand yep, by yep, the manifesto, yep, etc., yep, etc. Yep, 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 yep. I watched the whole of that debate yesterday. I watched Parliament most days. I watched Dennis Skinner, who's a Brexiteer, who sat there absolutely speechless. Yep. Not a single solitary thing did he say. And then him and his mate next to him, Ronnie Campbell, yep. they voted with the amendment. Yes, they voted. Then, they voted oh, yes. with their party against yes. everything. Both he and, Ro he and Ronnie had told their electorate. Yes, every single solitary word. Now, I've been in touch before with Kate Hoey. I've emailed her and said to her, she's the only Brexit she's on the Labour benches who says anything in the House of Commons. Them two sit at the front door. <laughs> well, she needs some help. Well, well, to be fair, Jim, it wasn't just Kate Hoey that went against her party last night on this and stuck with her principles, and ones that she was clear about in her own election address, Frank Field did exactly the same thing, and Frank Field today warned that Labour now is very vulnerable. It could lose a huge number of votes on this Brexit issue. But, Jim, I think you're right. I, I you know, I can't disagree with the mail. I mean, I've had... I've had my uh, face uh, on the front page of newspapers with all sorts of things being said about me over the years. And, and in a free press, that's fine. That's what you live with. My feeling, Jim, is that from a Daily Mail perspective, this is almost a bit like friendly fire against your own side. They, you know, they may have let you down on this, but it's Labour that's the problem. It's Labour under Starmer that is completely letting down four to five million Labour Brexit voters, Jim. So I'm with you. What can be done, Jim? Well, all I'm saying is, if Skinner yep. was to come out and open his mouth and say what he wants, he's like a cult figure amongst Northern Labour people. And he would get loads of people on his side, and there would be a lot more what shall I say, far less apathy if they can get him to reel these people in. But he sits there, he does yeah. absolutely nothing and says nothing. It's very absolutely nothing. No, it's very, it's Sorry. very disappointing. Disappointing. Jim, I thank you. And Jim, I think he's right. Um, 
I don't know about Guy Verhofstadt. How can he talk about democracy winning with a straight face? Nothing about the EU is democratic, I get on Twitter. Well, lots and lots of strong opinion. I want to repeat my point that I do think, in many cases here, you've got Conservative MPs elected on a Brexit means Brexit manifesto who at no point told their own electors that they intended to try and slow up, delay or stop the process. That is wrong. In the case of Ken Clark and others who've got strong principles on this, I understand that. And I'd hate to see a parliament where everybody was dragooned into doing what their leader said. But we're all missing the point. It isn't 11 Tories that want to try and hold up Brexit. It's the Labour Party who have completely done a 180-degree turn from what they promised the electorate, and they're the people who Brexiteers really ought to be annoyed with. You've been listening to The Nigel Farage Show here on LBC. I'm back on Sunday morning at 10.